Good uh, I think today um, I will. It's my pleasure to produce an introduction on some basic direction and recent works in interpretable deep learning. So we all know that deep neural networks are almost everywhere. Uh, they can make medical decisions. They can use for self-driving car. Mm. But what have been learned inside? What has internal representation do, doing? That's a very two important questions to answer in real data. For example, if you contract a disease, are you willing to accept decision result produce a neural network? If you're willing to put your own child into a self-driving car? I think most people will answer no at this stage because uh, we want to know why. We want to know more reason, evidence to support the decision given by the network. So then how to answer those two questions is the topic of today's lecture. So um, I will cover four parts. So the first part is visualization method. So that's one of the post hoc inter interpretable method. Um, they approach the problem by, uh, by answering question about what a network or parts of network are looking for by generating fancy visualization examples. And the attribution method studies what part of an example is responsible for a network when some decision has been or some unit is activated. And we move on to interpretable systems that what about let's build an interpretable system by itself. We do not need external uh, explanation method to help us. So uh, if time allows, I also would like to introduce a little bit about some recent work in inter interpretation for GAN. So let's start with a very simple toy model. Um, so let's imagine a very simple task as we shown here um, on the right part. There's two kinds of dots, the yellow dot and blue dot, and the scatter in 2D space. So what do we want to do is that we want to classify them into uh, the end positive. It's a very simple task, and uh, we build a very simple network, as we shown on the left. Uh, and that we have the input of x1, x2, x1 square, x2 square, and then we can visualize um, each node by just a 2D plane we can visualize the decision boundary of each node directly. So it's, it is a simple model. So we can put it totally visible because of simpleness. So let's start training, see how uh, the visualization of every unit goes. So on the right part, you see how decision boundary change. And you can also see decision boundary change for each node. And on the top right, you will see the training loss and test uh, test loss and see the curve. All right, it seems like it converged and we have a view of, oh, oh, this network has such decision plane, but problems. What about a very deep new network? Can we do this? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, for we can do this first, first layer because we know that first layer filter, um, it only has three dimensions. So we can just visualize it. We can map to the those value to zero to 255 and visualize the image. You see some very familiar pattern like zebra, zebra pattern or chess, chessboard pattern. And we, have that, we can have a direct sense of what this filter is looking at. Um, but what about we do this for a deep layer? Can we um, understand this future? The answer is basically no, because there's too many nodes and it's too complicated to visualize. So we got to need a smarter way to visualize those filters in deep layer. So I will start by a very simple and effective method called maximally activated patch. So Let's say we have a network structure and we pick some node. By node, we are seeing the, the channel, one specific channel of the feature map. And we send all kinds of the patch uh, into the network and we rank them from highest to lowest so activation score of that unit. And we just simply select those 10 or, or whatever numbers you want or 10. So here I show 10 largest activation image patch for that unit. So then you have a clear sense of what this unit is looking like. Is 
this you filter uh, no so this this channel of feature map is basically looking at the dog nose it's looking at some specific pattern of character um, it's very simple and very effective so if someone have a new project say uh, oh I have a network I want to look at uh, what the units look like uh, doing in that network I think that's the this method is, is the first thing to try with and it's simple to implement so mm -hmm. We've seen how to use in distribution images to visualize unit by selecting our images with highest activation for that unit. So what about let's just opt optimize an image patch that can mostly activate that unit. So first thing is that we initialize the image to, to zero to noise input. <laughs> and we, we forward it to the network and we get the value of that unit and we compute gradient, go back to the uh, noise image. And that now we get some gradient and we make a, a, a step further to get some update. And we do this again and again, we see the final pattern here. So it's like this unit is detecting some, some tissue things looks like that. Um, but we cannot just do it for a single channel. We can also do it for a pixel location, a neuron, like here. Um, we can do this for channel as we have shown. We can do. We can also do this for the whole layer. We compute the gradient of this whole layer. And this is a very famous paper called Deep Dream. And then we can also do the um, class logits. We can do the class properties. We see different patches. Um, uh, uh, by activating on different layers or units. So the problem is that um, the actual, if you do that directly, you make computer gradient and you make update, the actual quality is not as good as you imagine as I show here. And if you do this directly, you will see some the image with a lots of high frequency noise. So they've got a way to optimize it. I think, um, so there are several tricks I proposed here to reduce this influence. For example, we know that the in natural image, um, in natural image where the neighboring pixels have a smoother than the generated image. You know the color of clothes are continuous. So we just need to penalize the variance between neighboring pixels. And we can, uh, given that we have a very high frequency of this pattern, we can just penalize the high frequency noise by just blurring out the image at each optimization step. So actually, we also want to generate image that activate the optimization target. Even this image is rotated or scaling or jitter. I mean, if a unit is detecting dog, then whenever this dog is shifted for how many pixels or rotated how many pixels, um, or a little dog or bigger dog. I think if the detect concept, detection concept for this unit is a dog, I think uh, whatever this perturbation should be fine. So you, you can do this in like a data augmentation way. Also, many people also have used a lot of models like GAN, VAE of the real data to generate photorealistic visualizations. So, um, all right, just introduce basic, um, no. So here is the unregularized feature visualization. And when we apply the frequency penalization, we see a smoother pattern a little bit. And after we apply the transformation robustness, we see a basically flourish pattern that people can understand, oh, this unit is basically detects some flower. So here we uh, is a list of methods that propose different tricks to make feature visualization more realistic. Um, for example, you have frequency penalization and transformation robustness, and some papers combine them together to make visualization. And then some methods, for example, uh, use the learned prior, like again, autoencoder at the last two row. You see that the visualization um, of the bird node is already real already photorealistic. 
So that's several amazing works. I hope if someone has interest, you can get a screenshot to uh, take a further read reading. So we just introduced uh, two very basic visualization methods of in in interpretation on this direction, and we can compare them. They approach the problem in a different way. They all make really great. Uh, they will make great uh, visualization, um, and you can see uh, they have different goals. And I will post here for any perspectives if any, anyone has. Okay. All right, so I will just continue. So we just talked about many fancy visualization tricks. So, but by those visualization, we can interpret as dog or baseball or the cloud uh, or the house house top. Um, but how do we move the visualize? But that's our human's interpretation. How can we interpret them quantitatively by model? Like like model can directly target this visualization as a baseball as a dog. We can measure it quantitatively. Uh, for, sure, for sure, we can do that. We can. Um, so, for example, we pick a unit in the specific layer. We 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 pick off those ten uh, maximal ac activated images. We cannot just pick those maximal activated images. We can also circle out. We can also. Um, pick the most activated area in that image. So we see that this unit is basically detecting the lamp. And suppose we have the ground truth mask for those images. So we have ground truth marks for the lamp. We could measure how uh, how much this unit is is predicting the uh, this lamp, how accurate it is. For example, if this unit is also detecting something else, uh, some some part of the unit is detecting the bed, sometimes it's detecting the lamp, this score should, should be lower. So we use a, mess, a score called IOU score to calculate this uh, intersection. The full name of inter, uh, IOU score is the intersection over union. It's very simple to compute. So you just need to compute the area of the activation area of the unit generated and the concept ground truth area. And you measure, you just need to divide by the intersection over the union region to, to measure the IOU score to see how much overlap is the unit with the concept. Then you have a one to one correspondence between the unit of the given concept you want. Yo, sorry to interrupt here. I, I have yeah. a question. Can you go back to the previous slides? Yes. Um, I think it would be helpful if you can actually explain how do you get this localized oh. region for surrounding the, the lamp in this uh, kind of either through oh. optimization or what are the techniques? Thanks. Sure, no problem. Um, so we all know that the unit in the in that layer is a map. So it's like you have in ResNet in the last day you have fifteen five hundred times seven times seven, and we pick one unit. It's like we pick a channel of seven times seven map. So you have a visual for for that uh, feature map. You have different value, right? So you have highest level, you you have the lowest value, and the, you just, it's like a mountain. You you can plot a heat map if you want. And you just cut the mountain at some threshold and uh, pick those highest region and map it back, resize, resize the, those feature map back onto the region, and you will have the corresponding region. So those regions are the highest uh, highest image patch that activate this unit. Um, I'm not sure if I'm clear, Sharon. Yeah, that's pretty clear. It sounds like it's a thresholding, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a simple thresholding trick. Sorry for missing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. 
Uh, I think we have another question from um, Abirav. Yeah, so in the internal representations, the dimensions might change uh, of the image. And how can we be sure that uh, you know it's one to one mapping onto the original image? Whatever region that we get, it's you can map it to the original input. I don't know if my question is. So um, your question is that how do we ensure that the, uh, this unit must be aligned with concept? Must the, yeah, this unit must yeah, be yeah. So that's your question, right? Okay, I can yeah. answer with that. Um, um, so, for the we are doing an analysis on the uh, analyze on a tr already trained network. So this net already been trained. We are not analyzing during the training. So the unit should be fixed, right? So um, when you form forwarding an image, the activation of that unit is fixed. And we don't just measure the one concept score. So we for that unit we measure all the IOU score of all the concepts. And we pick the largest one as the one-to-one <coughs> -one correspondence with the unit. I'm not, uh, is that clear? So it's like you have IOU score, score of dog is like 0.12, and you have IOU score for cat is 0 0.04. And this unit is most like detecting dog. Uh, am I asking a question? Kind, kind of, um, yeah. My understanding of what Abra probably is trying to ask, let's say now you have this uh, feature, you know, the, the channel of size seven by seven, right? And in terms of size, oh. and there's a mismatch in between oh, your, your, so. your feature size versus your original input image. How do you kind of map back to this uh, input? I think that, oh, so that's probably I, So concerned. you have a feature map with seven times seven, you just need to resize the image seven times seven. Like you interpolate between the pixels and you just need like in, in Python you have scpy.misc. You from import image resize. You resize that directly to the uh, like two hundred times two hundred, which is the image size. And you have a new feature map and you just uh, mix it add a binary mask, you stretch threshold it then and the times with original image. So it, right. and yeah, and the, um, on that image, so for example, on the feature map, the, the, the center, 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 center part is with highest activation. It's also corresponding to the image region with the central part. So it's a one-to-one -one corresponding region thing. Yeah. Uh, all right. All right, I think I will just move on. Um, so to detect those units concept, we need to build a large data set called Broaden. A Broaden data set is a, is a combination of different set, data set with segmentation, ground truth mask. It contains scene, object, part, material, or even texture and color. So it it's very crazy. You have all the texture uh, segmented and you have all the color segmented. And you just need to compare how much region this unit is detecting, uh, focusing on the pink color, and you have an indicator of how, how much this unit, in, unit is detecting at the color. And we have some examples of different units. For example, we have this unit has high IOU score on the head, and it's only visualized high focus on the head and if the unit have high focus on the castle, lamps and the stairways. Th those are very typical units have very strong semantics. And if we make a statistics uh, on the AdixNet, you see the final layers, it have 32 units detecting an object, uh, six detecting things, only one detecting colors because it is in the final layer. If in a previous layer there was a more texture or color units. So um, we have a video. We, we, I will show a very interesting application that we show how unit semantic change during uh, fine tuning. Uh, I will grab some water in one minute. Um, 
So you see that the we fine tuning from places to image net, it changed the unit's semantic to the spike of the tower to the dog's ear. It have similar pattern, but they have different semantics. They all are kind of spike things. So that's a very interesting visualization, and we can use that net dissection to visualize this process. All right, so uh, I will just move on to the attribution method. We have talked a lot of uh, visualization tricks. So attribution method is like when we make a predict of this image as a dog, we need to know that which pixel, pixel makes the model believe that it is a dog. So that's what attribution method is trying to uh, reach to put a heat map for for the dog image. So I would we just introduced about the visualization method, feature visualization method. What about let's do that directly? We do it. So we visualize. For example, we put all kinds of node and uh, we we visualize the node on the corresponding pixel locations. We we see that on the dog part there's a lot of doggy dog units. On the cat part there's a lot of cat units. On the grass part there's lots of grass units. It somewhat pro provides some explanation of what is detecting it. And we could also uh, based on on the prediction score we also times those feature visualization related by the uh, units magnitude. So with more meaningful parts leads to larger a uh, uh, larger area, we see that the dog areas are more significant. So we could also directly visualize the unit connection, though it somewhat makes some sense. I mean, it still looks vague to me. It can provide us some sense why it makes prediction. So that's one method I would like to. There are um, also many interesting visualization on the website I put on left button, if you are interested. So, um, if we want to know what part of matters more when making prediction, we can just hide that part and see how much class score drop, how much accuracy has been changed during this process. So it's like if I hide this part, is it more makes the network believe more or do more dog or less dog, and we have a a score, a corresponding score of that uh, that thing changed. I mean, more meaningful part. Uh, if this part is more important, the score drops more. We can put a heat map for that. So for example, if I want to predict the schooner, um, most of heat uh, heat map is focused on the schooner part. We can do this for the elephant, for the car. But we also see this advantage of this method, like the heat map is not very clean, right? So we can try something else. For example, saliency map. What about let's just compute the gradient of this image to that class? So the very clear sense that more meaningful parts leads to larger gradient. But you see that uh, if you directly visualize the gradient, it's still not very clear to see. It's somewhat like a dog, but people cannot understand. So someone proposed a method called guided by Brock. So when you have input image, you forward pass it, you have different feature uh, feature map, we call it F. And when you calculate gradient, we have gradient map called L, R, called RL. And uh, yeah. So when you do the forward pass, you have those value and the uh, radio function will just filter out those value, which is smaller than zero. And when you do the back propagate past, those binary masks will time on the gradient. So you see those red red part zero and then uh, will be set to zero when the gradient has been calculated. And there's also another way of back propagation, which is called deconv way. So it's just to set those gradient with negative value to zero. And if you combine them together, it comes guided back propagation. So this is how simple this method is. It simply computes the binary mask of the feature map and the binary cost of computed by the gradient map and you combine them together. It becomes guided back propagation and it leads to better visualization results. Why is this happening? 
I think it's basically because positive message carries more information than negative message do, but it's a still mystery. So you see the visualization result of uh, bad propagation that's right here. So um, red part is max activated patch as a com comparison. You see the uh, dog's nose are more clear in the, uh, in, on the left part compared to, com compared to the previous uh, visualizing result, result here. So um, you could also use feature map, a direct feature map as a direct attribution method. So this is a very famous method called class activation mapping. So before we introduce this method, I would introduce a very famous st structure called ResNet-like structure. So this structure is basically, um, first you have a stacked convolutional block and then you have a global average pooling layer, and then you, you have the final co fully connected layer, and it make the and finally it's class uh, probability. So this kind of structure we call uh, many structures uh, looks like this. For example, ResNet, DanceNet, and uh, AlexNet. Now uh, we we have some AlexNet changed the form into something looks like this. The basic similarity is that they all have a global average pooling layer at the final convolutional block and have a fully, one, only one fully connected layer. So if your network looks like this, you can use the CAM trick. So the CAM trick is very, sim uh, it's very simple. So traditionally, when you do the global average pooling, pooling, so you average all the value of the green map into only one scalar value, value uh, here. So, and the green scalar value will time WN and it goes to the class score. So now, in, by inference, the, by generating CAM map, you do not do the global average pooling. You just time every uh, value on the green map directly by WN. You have a new map and you combine them together, it becomes the class activation mapping. So traditionally, if you regard every small, uh, the blue or red, red map here, you can regard the, if you apply the global average pooling layer, it's just one value and the, the computed is exactly class activation score. Now you remove global average pooling, it becomes class activation mapping. So this method is very simple and direct to, um, to, to implement, I think. So when you predict that this guy is brushing teeth, this guy is cutting trees, um, the class activation mapping, we have told you that this network mostly put attention on, on the mouth, on the hand, and the cutting, when you're cutting trees, the networks that will tell you uh, the, the human and the, the wood are important for predicting that he is cutting tree. But we all know that, we all see the limitation here. The limitation here um, is that the CAM require a stru specific structure to produce a CAM map. What about we want to visualize the uh, map composed of inter intermediate layer or structure does not look like a ResNet? Then we need a CAM. The grid CAM is also very simple. Um, so you just simply, so we, since that for intermediate layer, we do not have W directly connect to the class score. Now we can use gradient, right? We can compute the gradient from the final class score and to the given layer we want. Now we just replaced W by the gradient as we shown on the, on the previous slide. We replace the W here by the gradient value. We combine, compose it here together and it becomes the uh, uh, grad can visualization. So you just need, in this graph, you just need to focus upon the red box here. Our other part are, very, are more complicated to understand. So a very interesting story that Greta Ken is a very famous method, but it has been rejected for three times when it got submission. Uh, mostly because it, I think it's complicating the story. It combines guided prep propagate, Tell story about image caption, VQA, things like that. It's, I think it makes things too complex. But now it, he, this paper got 3,000 citations, which makes a very famous. So, um, so anyway, so.
so how do so we get a visualization of CAN? How do we do a similar story like from attribution to interpretation? How do we interpret the CAN? Now we it's like we can only get a kind of a vague sense what this uh, network is looking at. We have some feedback. Oh, this means something like this pick status uh, to make this predictable. But can we decompose into something like this? Because 20% of the network, because it's detecting at the hedge, because the network is somewhat focusing on the poem, somewhat focusing on the bruise, somewhat focusing on sculpture. We we interpret the network into start. In, we want the network to interpret things like looks like that. Um, so it's a similar story in net dissection. Um, so we we first put a similar structure in CAM here. We know CAM is generated by that W dot product with feature map on the channel dimension. Suppose God, there is a God told us that there's a lots of concept vectors like Q table is representing the table concept and the Q wall is representing the wall concept. If God told us that, things like that, we can decompose the class weight by some linear algebra tricks into those uh, several meaningful components. When we use those concept vectors to form different concept maps, we are actually decomposing the CNN maps into several concept maps that we can interpret. So you see here is a sofa, uh, sofa table will have different uh, concept maps. But there is no God in computer vision. Can we train such concept vector? The answer is yes. It's just similar in um, yes in net dissection. You have a, a bunch of um, ground truth segmentation mask, and you have a suppose you have a, a vector. You just need to find a vector. Um, we train a concept vector that dot production with a feature map has the largest IOU score with the real concept segmentations. It's like a a training and segmentation marks, yes. And we after training we have a concept vector. So the IBG frameworks look like that. We first have a weight vector WK, and we have many interpretable basis Q, C, I, and uh, we have we define coefficient for the interpretable basis S, C, I, and the residual R is also in the same dimension with weight vector and interpretable basis. So our task is to find the uh, coefficient to minimize the residuals norm, where WK, the weight vector, can be represented in a way of linear combination of the constructors. So it's very simple. We just need to apply Grady algorithm. Suppose we already have selected a set of concept column. We just need to find another that can minimize. Uh, we search the, all the concept uh, re repository, and we find the one can minimize the residual to the utmost. So um, by applying this method, we could do many. For the um, for example, we can visualize how um, when when the networks are predicting the dining hall, what concept is this unit is using it? For example, the ResNet 18 using plate, wine glass, light, stool to predict it is a dining hall. ResNet 15 use something else like table, chandelier, uh, wall. So we see that different networks have different strategy to um, to visualize the uh, uh, different net, different strategy to predict the, the, the same class. So here um, we have, we simply measure the correspondence between the, uh, between the weight vector and the concept vector. So the larger the thicker line represents a larger correspondence. So we can also see that even though in a same network, when predicting different classes, they are using kind of the same same concept, like the bottle and the canyon, they both use cliff as the very important concept clue to make prediction. So besides that, we there are all many more complicated interpretation methods. Like you can interpret the network structure as explanation graph. 
you can interpret it as decision tree. So like when detecting a horse, is there any question? Uh, yes, I actually was curious if you can go back yeah, one mm -hmm. slide earlier. I think it also has a question. Maybe let's address his first. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the norm of residual being minimized? Would L1 or L2 norm uh, have L different effects? Um, yeah, yes, basically we uh, by pointing vector we use L2. Uh, but we didn't try L1. Uh, my question was more like if you have basis vectors where, which are not independent in that case, uh, minimizing L2 will do like spread the attribution to all the basis vectors which are kind of similar while L1 will just pick one of them. So. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, what you just say was probably right. I mean, those concept vector are not independent to each other. So. But, but what you just said, I mean, all things, uh, experiment shows that all things converge to only one concept and that does not happen because they are trained in the, they are trained independently with the different concept masks. So every concept vector has their own semantic meanings and when making decomposition, uh, they have, I mean, they act differently. I see, okay, yes. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think I'll go through to understand what the uh, these concept vectors are that might clarify. Yeah, no problem. I'm one. I think I'm one of the author in this paper. You can ask, send email to uh, directly ask me the question of that. So, okay. Can I ask a follow-up question here on your method? Yeah. This one. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering, as you mentioned this. Uh, decomposition idea, right? So in your current IBD framework, um, you have to rely on the segmentation masks in order to kind of learn this basis vectors and also corresponding um, coefficients, right? Like here, yes. Do you, like, has there any be any follow-up work or is it possible to actually learn this without um, segmentation supervision to learn this decomposition. That is really, really hard. So I think imagine in a very simple simple scenario. So in training data set, we only have four kinds of ball, red ball, blue ball, red, red cube, blue cube. Is there an unsupervised way can, uh, I mean, in some way unsupervised ex extract those two uh, directions? I actually think about it and try different methods, they all fail. And I mean, not to mention so much complicated concepts like colors, texture, materials. So I think that it's very, very hard if we do this unsupervisedly. Interesting. Okay, sounds like you've tried some of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks to you. And no problem. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so there is a much more works like explanation graph or decision trees. They have the common things like um, they want to transform the network to something we already know, like it's graph and the trees. And they just need to extract some similar pattern coexist uh, when making prediction. I will not cover too much details here for the time limitation. If someone is interested, I'm uh, welcome to read that paper. All right, so we've seen a lot of the post hoc explanation method. I will move on to the interpretable system. So we've seen IBD methods, like you see a great, a fancy visualization uh, of the scan method, and you, but you still see there's a large residual here, which cannot be uh, mitigated. So the method is incomplete. And you will, you also have things that building block of interpretability, they visualize something which makes some sense, but still vague to us. So can, the very important question is that, can we trust those interpretable methods? A very important paper has discussed about that. I think the someone will make this presentation 
one week later, also on Thursday. So let's see. The explanation must be wrong. If the explanation was completely faithful to what the original model computes, the explanation would equal the original model, and one would not need the original model in the first place, only the explanation. In other words, there's a case that original model would be interpretable by its. So it is saying that the explanation cannot be 100% true, otherwise this model is interpretable by itself. So I explain models that have 90% agreement with the original model indeed explain something, like it indeed explains the original model most of the time. However, the explanation model that is correct 90% of time is wrong 10% of time. 90% uh, is already high confidence. Most of the time I think those, they are only 50%. So how do we mitigate this effect? So the question is similar to answer, how to optimize a network that is by design interpretable. So um, Trinson Juice Group has a very famous work, um, Interpol Convolution Network. Oh, sorry. So, <coughs> so what they do is that the basic, uh, they want to pick a layer and let letting every filter in that layer to be focused at some specific part of the object. What they do is also very simple. They pick one. And um, for each unit in that layer, they assign with a specific template with some specific sign and shape. So you see um, they have different masks. And after applying mask, uh, you have a regularized filter attention area focusing on some head area. So that's what they're trying to do, and it's it's like you have original classification optimization goal plus extra interpretable constraint. So that's what they did, and uh, here I just made a very simple high-level introduction of what they did. Details also also in papers. Um, so another very famous work is like this looks like that. So we can train some prototype for inference. So the leftmost is test image of clay colored sparrow and uh, what in second column is some bounding box generated. Uh, please that looks similar to that prototype. Those prototypes are shown in third column and the fourth. They are picked from training data set. And the last column is a heat map indicating how similar the prototypical parts resemble the parts of the bird. And they make it the network finally make prediction only based on their similarity score. So that model, in, the, in that design, the model is interpretable at the prototype, pro, prototype layer and makes a classification only based on that. So the network is interpretable by itself. And uh, the result also looks good in that paper. So here comes the idea. A similar idea with prototype is a capsule net. So, Can we implicitly learn this prototype and capsule this into a capsule? So Hinton believes that different objects are a composition of concepts or capsules. Different compositional way or different capsules make the different objects. For example, we all have you all have rectangular and triangles, but you make different objects like a boat and the house. So if the triangle is used for house. Uh, so suppose we given a image like a boat here, and we want to detect if it is a boat. So we have the triangle uh, and rectangular. We ask them the question: If I'm used for house or boat, and they they will have different level of agreement. For example, if the triangle believes it is a house, you have a row downward. If the tri Rectangular believe I'm a house, they have the rectangular upward. Only when they make a strong agreement that, oh, I am a boat, then make the prediction that it is a boat. So that's a high level picture of how capsule net work. So here um, I will go in detail. Up. So it may distort in that it's lost lots of mathematics in here, the routing algorithm, but I will explain combined with the previous example to explain what it is the represent. So the UIJ, UJI here are the rectangular and the triangle I just posed. And they want to pre, uh, yeah, so 
so the BIJ is the agreement between uh, agreement of how UIJ with the boat or house and the S I S J represent S J represent the house or the boat. So uh, let's take a look how this air grid grazing runs. So first, firstly, you set all the agreement to zero and make a soft max condition, and I will explain why there's soft max here later. Um, and then for every so for every capsule J in the like the S J is represent the house and the boat I mentioned like for the house the score is compute computed by the agreement uh, like C I J it represents the, some soft math scores agreement score you is the linear combination of the uh, those triangles and the rectangulars and you make uh, a normalization becomes VJ and then you can compute those agreements like UJI times VJ is agreement between uh, between the capsule of the houseboat and the triangle and the rectangular things like that and you do this several agents and finally the rectangular and the triangle will find the right boat or house so here the soft max well, you see that the CJ is kind of a gating variable that control the routing, with, which is determined by the BIJ. BIJ is a agreement. So how is this instantiated? So the software func function ensures that only one gate will be largely open from lower level unit to a set of higher level units. So it's like they only allow the rectangular or triangular to only activate one, you, you should I, I pick house or boat, not both. So that's how this high level idea of this network, uh, this algorithm is uh, working on this dynamic connection. And it's very it's somewhat um, effective. We can visualize some capsule, what is the semantics look, looks like. Some capsule is detecting scale and thickness, some are detecting a localization. So that's the basic some visualized in the Hinton's paper. All right, so next next method, I will start from two papers. One paper is from the net dissection I just mentioned. So they tried to set up the one-to-one -one correspondence between the unit and the concept. And the next paper uh, is also very important. I haven't mentioned it, but I will mention here. So we list the 512 units in the last layer of ResNet that contributes to the hotel prediction. And I sorted from the highest to lowest contribution. So the contribution is sorted by, um, if that unit is important, you just delete that unit to see how accuracy drops. And you see the, there's a five, five units drop significantly. Uh, when you remove it, the accuracy drops significantly, like yours, hotel, bedroom, bed chamber, trust room, uh, hotel room. So an uh, astonishing finding is that if you just keep those five five units, you you remove all other units, the model can still make like ninety five percent of accuracy. So that's an astonishing finding. So it means that totally possible that we can train a network that kind of truncates the long tail of contribution and only keeps those few interpretable units to predict that this unit is a hotel. So we can let's maybe design a network that can only connect interpretable units for prediction. It's kind of uh, related to uh, the capsules, papers, dynamic idea. So this is what we want. So we want to predict cost. Only use the beach and the water unit. You have a semantic interpretation with the cost equals beach plus water. Similarly, iceberg equals water plus mountain snow. Swamp equals water plus forest and volleyball core equals beach plus sports field. We want that network to look like that. What goodness of that? It ha it's sparse, it reduces parameters to analyze. It's simulatability, and humans under simulate this uh, decision-making process. And uh, it means the meaningful units can be interpretable independently. I mean, the unit should be focusing on the water itself. It cannot just simultaneously detecting water, dog, or everything else. This makes the, this unit totally uninterpretable. And if we have those three property and we add up them together, it makes the interpretability. It makes the network more interpretable. 
So the uh, main intuition here. Uh, so network has this following simple structure. Based on the ResNet backbone, we just need replace the final fully connected layer with a dynamic connection layer. What does it mean? Consider an example. If we want to tag the first image as a water part car, we should just need to consider two units, water and amusement device. Similarly, for this sample, um, we need water, building, and dam to make it kennel. And for that, for this one, uh, we just need amusement device units. So now I would like to show concrete algorithm how we achieve that. So it's like we were uh, given the input of convolutional feature layers. We can plot it. The X is some some feature layers in the specific feature maps in the specific layer. In, for example, in ResNet, is layer four. We have 512, and we make a plot of TSNE. We average the uh, average the every feature map, and uh, we have 512 value, mm, and we make a plot that looks like this. And after all the after you time some like W dog with the weight factor of the dot class, the feature map changed. So we can visualize those things. And um, normally, if we sum them up, uh, I mean, I sum all the dog time x up, it becomes the dog's class score. But if we, yeah, it has a correspondence between the dog, uh, every single, if we something add, it becomes a dog score. And if we make a ranking and make a selection, like every time I only select those units with high activation, and we we select those units, looks like that. Um, and we do this every time in the forwarding path for every image. We every time we just choose the top, uh, like top two or top five values. In, in making this uh, in, in prediction dog class. It's a very simple and method. It's maybe just need four or five lines change in PyTorch code, but it has very astonishing interpret result. So after training, you will see that uh, we can evaluate the concept composability directly by viewing the connection. So now that there are absolutely no units, uh, no other units uh, participating in, in the prediction, for example, for the air, airplane cabin, you just need three units to make the prediction. Airplane cabin, co cockpit, landro mark. You have, and you do not need other um, explanation to help you. Uh, of, of course, those units are uh, are annotated by the net dissection method. But my point is that you do not need IBD framework to help you disentanglement, and it does not have the residual. You just need to take a look at those three units, and it's interpretable. So that's what I might mean by training a more interpretable layer. So finally, I found we still got some time. Um, we, we, I will introduce a little bit of work interpretation for GAN. So for example, let's, I think some people may be familiar with progressive GANs. They can gener generate many photorealistic images. Uh, but you see, just some image have some watermark. This is mainly because in the training data set, there's a lot of the uh, church with that watermark. And the gen generator basically learn to learn that signal. And we do uh, the trick that we just introduced, max activation uh, activated units. For example, in layer five, the neuron 200, fine. And you, you see that this unit basically focusing on the watermark part. And you pick those, you just choose those units as up and you delete those units, you find the watermark just disappears. And uh, so we can we can use a similar trick as a net dissection and make it again dissection. So it's like you generate you generate an image with some trees and you you can use some segmentation segmentation method to produce a mask of the tree. And uh, you also have some unit generating some feature map, and you have a heat map, maybe some part is detecting a tree. And you just measure the 
uh, IOU scored as we just did. We measured to see how this unit focusing on the tree concept. We can also do a similar story as net concept concept uh, net dissection did. Eo, we have a question here. Yes. How do you generate correspondence between the unit and image parts for GAN? Oh, so correspond units and uh, so um, it's like we like we so you can regard the GAN model as an upside down classification uh, network. So the GAN is starting from some in some noise vector like 100 dimension and the, and then generate the image. You can do it the same way. I mean those units are also feature map. The, for example, this unit have a seven times seven size, and you can make a heat map as a, you, you have a different value on this feature map, and you just scale, resize it to the image level. Uh, I mean, and I want to know what loss function you'd use for gradient based heat maps. Or basically, it's not the same as classification, so there is no particular node which is being used to say it's a dog. Oh, so here we do not use any gradient things. So here is like you can ignore all the units afterwards, like here. So you ignore this one. You just make a forward path. You forward path here and the forward path here. You have activation map of this red node. You have like seven times seven activation map, and you make it a heat map. You thresholding it, and you can make some visualization like that. And you resize it to the image level, of course. So there's no gradient uh, uh, participating here. Oh, OK. Uh, in that case, the uh, identification of the node which gives watermark, you would have to manually go through each node and figure out which one is associated with watermark? Yeah, this, that's what GAN dissection did, right? So you, like, suppose we have a segmentation model. We can, they can, they can segment some ground truth area of watermark part. Then you can compute IOU score between the unit activation area and the segmentation area, right? Oh, so that's what. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. So, so you can regard again dissection as, as an upside down model. Uh, so that's very similar to dissection. It's the same idea on on a different model. All right. So, um, this is a very small I want to introduce, and. You can do some very, as long as you have every unit annotated, you can just find some unit called tree unit. You increase their value on the corresponding area. You find that you can add more trees on the image part. For example, if you don't like the window generated image, you just find some window units and you erase those units. And so what is the funny about GAN is like, you can manipulate, it's like you are creating the word by Manipulating this unit. That's the classification model cannot have. You will have much more fun in the GAN generation. So if you want a door here, you just find a door unit and activate value. So similarly, you add a glass to the man. So there's uh, also much interesting, a, a lot of interesting work on GAN interpretations. They interpret on the, not just unit, on the hidden latent space. You will find some interesting properties like thickness, hair, rotation background blur, uh, background removal, things like that. So those are very recent work. And if anyone interesting, you can take a look. Uh, Eo, I have a quick question here. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. This is really cool, I think. Are, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, are all the units like equally, perhaps not, right? If you, if you learn something that is more, if the feature learned by the unit is more disentangled in some sense, then it's probably safe to remove that. But in contrast, if you accidentally remove a unit that is kind of picking up on multiple objects, would that lead to some artifact in the uh, generated? A very interesting story is that you will find some unit is generating some artifacts. So it's like some units is participating the artifact generation, you remove that unit and the image quality can be improved. And of course there are some units. So there are also some units 
doing offsite work, uh, I did not run their experiment individually, but I'm sure if there are some units, if you remove, you will destroy the network structure. But you know, there's uh, actually like thousands of units there. You remove one or two of them, it does not make a, a lot of difference. Actually, what I, I am simplifying their process. What they actually did is that they find a group of tree units, you remove it. So single unit does not have strong power. I'm simplifying this idea here. So, uh, so what okay. you just said is, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Has some work been done with disentanglement in GANs? Can you comment on that? That's, uh, that's lots of work. But what I just said is an example. For example, if you want to design again, train on Red Bull, blue ball, red cube, blue cube. Um, if the game is unsupervised, currently there are no method can completely disentanglement so, uh, those two semantic direction unsupervisedly. So that's a very interesting research uh, direction. Yeah, and we'll also actually later in the semester, we'll have uh, dedicated sections on GAN and I'll you know cover some of the variational autoencoder which allows you to do some of the disentanglement so you know yeah. stay tuned for those. I mean currently as I just said if so those post hoc explanation methods they are incomplete and inaccurate if you are trying to use external frameworks to explain the uh, latent latent some latent space in GAN See, you, while you, for example, you want to change the hair of a woman, you're not just changing the, the hair of the woman, you're also changing the smile. You also make it older or younger. I mean, if you want to, if this is unsupermastered, you want to fully disentanglement out a vector or a unit that only controls the hair, that will be super, super hard. That's what I'm trying to convey. And that's, I think, the very, uh, so you, you see the most recent paper here is 2020 and July. So I believe this is a very active researching area now. Those are very recent work. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Eo. Yeah, I think that's basically all I want to share with.